Thanks, Ira and Nick. It's a great pleasure to be here to present our work on cyanobacteria and metal homeostasis, uh, especially in the cytochrome C6 and processing switch in cyanobacteria. The work mainly done by Raquel Garcia Cañas, a PhD student. They will be actually defending tomorrow her PhD. Most of the, what I'm going to show you is it's been by her. So metals are essential for all organisms because they are part of many proteins that are needed for either functioning or folding of uh, many proteins. And that's especially true for enzymes where around half of the enzymes needs a metal to work properly. Actually, photosynthesis is a high metal demanding process, especially because the photosynthetic machinery is iron and manganese rich. So there's a lot of iron needed for PS2, cytochrome P6F, PS1, but also for cytochrome C6 or ferredoxin, which are the soluble transporters for electron in photosynthesis. And this is reflected in much higher concentration of metals in photosynthetic organisms. And for example, here we're comparing uh, an E. coli cell to the range of the metals found in cyanobacteria. And you see that iron is like 20 times more abundant in cyanobacteria than in E. coli. Copper and manganese has even higher concentration. And even for zinc, which is a quite common metal in many processes like ribosome or transcription, Cyanobacteria have a much higher requirement, it's especially because they have carbonic anion rays that you see zinc and that it is required for photosynthesis. Cyanobacteria also causes a, a big problem for especially iron availability and metal availability in general because oxygenic photosynthesis releases oxygen which will oxidize iron and that makes it much less soluble and less available. And that actually happens early when cyanobacteria appear, when oxygenic photosynthesis started. I started locally oxidizing iron and precipitating it, but later on when the material expanded and generated a greater oxygenation event, and later on with the appearance of algae and plants, oxygen concentration raised. And that causes actually a big change in availability of different metals. So iron decreases and some other increases the availability. And that changes how all organisms could access them and how they have been used in evolution. In response to this reduced iron availability after appearance of oxygen, cyanobacteria evolved two alternative electron transporters in the photosynthetic machinery. These are the ferrodoxin, flavodoxin pair. These are the final acceptor of PS1. Ferrodoxin is an iron sulfur protein, while flavodoxin has an FMN cofactor as a redox active cofactor. And the other one was lasocyanine. It's an alternative to cytochrome C6 that is the ancestor of the electron transporter between cytochrome B6F and PS1. These two pairs are not expressed continuously, but are regulated. The flavoxin ferrodoxin pair is controlled by the master regulator of uh, iron homostasis in bacteria, FUR. There's an attraction factor. It will bind to genes that are expressed under iron deprived conditions, but for cytochrome C6 and plasmodium is not identified. Despite it was discovered more than 40 years ago, even earlier, in 1966, there was already a paper that suggested that these two proteins were regulated in cyanobacteria, but it's not what until the early 80s in the, of, of the last century, when it was very clear that these two proteins were regulated in cyanobacteria. The actually, plasmodium is expressed if copper is present in the media, while cytochrome C6 is expressed when copper is not present in the media. This regulation, it was described long ago that it was mainly at the transcriptional level. So in the absence of copper, the PJ gene that goes for cytochrome C6 is expressed. And this expression is shut down if you add copper to the media. At the same time, the PJ gene that goes for flatosanine will be induced. And that's how uh, the protein is regulated. You actually look at the proteins, you see exactly the same. You see a down regulation of cytochrome C6 in cells that have been grown without copper and you have copper. You see down regulation of it and an induction of the plasticine. This has led to the use of these two promoters in both basic and applied research for a long time. Two papers I know, they have used these two promoters to regulate genes in cyanobacteria. And there are a few very applied research use of for producing ethanol or other commodities in cyanobacteria. There's a few patents using them. But I'm sure that many of you in the audience have heard of it or have used them directly. Despite these two genes, the regulatory system was completely unknown. People were using it, but it was not known how they were regulated. It's not because people have not looked for the regulators. I'm sure that not only me, but many other people have looked for the regulator. People have tried all the copper-dependent attractional factor is different in cyanos or in other bacteria and look for the homologs in cyanos and try to see if these two genes were regulated by this. And for some time, it was proposed that FUR was controlling the switch, but neither was controlled by FUR. That's clear since a few years ago now. Few groups I know that have looked for it and we were not very successful. 
but with a sequence of many uh, more genomes and a wet bioinformatics allow us to identify the regulator. It's just looking at the genomes by hand, one by one, looking at the genes and the neighborhood of the genes of interest, just one by one in hundreds of genomes. And that gave us a clue. And in some genomes, either PT gene or the PJ gene was close to a pair of genes that coded for a transcriptional factor, the PLA, I, and COPA, Y superfamily, and a proteasis. And these two genes, they were always forming an operon. The stop code of the first gene was overlapping the ATG of the second one. That was very conserved. A more bioinformatic research showed us that these two new genes were conserved in all strains that presented both of the soluble electron transporters, or most of them presented both, except for one clade, that is Sunecococcus prococcus clade. And it was known for a while that these two genes are not regulated in, in Elongatus. It was not regulated of the metaproteomics of the marine prococcus and Sunecococcus. So it makes some sense that these two genes are not actually regulated in this clade to try to see if that was the, finally the regulator of the switch. So we decided to take it to our favorite system, the Synecocystis, and we generated the mutant in the corresponding gene. First, we knock out the transcriptional factor and analyze the expression of these two genes in response to copper. As you can see here, the PETR mutant, that's uh, the transcriptional factor, we renamed it PETR. The cytochrome C6 gene is not expressed at all even in a copper-free medium, while the plastocyanin gene is expressed even in the absence of copper, showing that that was the regulator for these two genes. We look at the proteins, it was exactly the same. Cytochrome C6 is not expressed at all in this strain, and plastocyanin is always expressed even in the absence of copper, although it accumulated after copper addition. So that was the first gene. What about the second one, that the protease? We need also the knockout mutant, and the protease shows exactly the opposite phenotype. Cytochrome C6 is expressed always, and plastocyanin is not expressed at all. And when we look at the proteins, we saw exactly the same. So we see always cytochrome C6, but we never see plastocyanin. Here we have a marker gene, COPM, and this is involved in copper resistance. And you see the gene is expressed in the same way in all three strains, indicating that it's not a problem in the copper metabolism itself, but specifically for the regulation of these two genes. Because the second gene is a protease, and this is a transcriptional factor, we thought that might be that the protease is regulating the levels of the transcriptional factor in response to copper, and actually it was the case. When we analyzed the level of beta R after copper addition, we see a clear degradation of the protein, or a decrease in levels, and this decrease is not seen in a PET-P mutant lacking the protease. When we analyze the steady state levels, we see exactly the same. We actually see that the levels we get in the PET-P mutant, the mutant in the protease, is always higher than in the wild type, and it's even higher than in the wild type in the presence of a specific copper collator that makes there's no copper available. So it's really regulating the system here. Once we identified the system, we thought, okay, let's, let's see how many genes are regulated by this regulatory system. So we ran a second analysis to see if there were more genes under the control of this new regulatory system. Unfortunately, we only found three transcriptional units. The two were well known before, PT, PJ, and an operon of two genes, SLR0601 and SLR0602, expressed as a single transcription unit. And see how they change in the different mutants plus minus copper. These two genes, they show the same expression pattern as the PJ, so they are expressed only in copper-free media. We have a transcriptional factor and a protease, but we didn't know if the regulation was direct. It was possible that it was a small RNA, an antisense RNA, or any other type of regulation to prove that the regulation was direct. We carried m assay with all three promoters of the genes identified in the transcriptomic, and actually the PETAR protein is able to bind directly to all three promoters, although the affinity for them is quite different, but that's how it is. We don't know until now why these differences are like this. What we could find is uh, motifs in the different promoters. And for that, what we did is just to retrieve all the PJ and PTE promoters from the genomes that contain both genes and contain also the regulatory system, PET-R and PET-P. So we retrieve like 100 different promoters and look for uh, conserved motifs. When we use both genes with both set of promoters, both PT and PJ promoters, we identified a core binding motif like this with a core sequence in GAC and 5 GTC. But when we use only PJ or PTE, we could identify slightly different motifs, although the core sequences were conserved. 
if you look at the position of these sequences in Sinecosita and Avina, that two strains where the transcriptional start sites of these genes are mapped, you see that in the PGA promoter, the binding sequences uh, overlap at minus 35 box, which is consistent with the activator position, while in the PTE promoter, they are between the minus 10 and minus 35, which is consistent to being average person in this gene. Exactly matches what we've observed in the mutant strains. Analyzing a bit more the sequences, you see that the sequences in the PGA promoters are actually an inverted repeat, but also two direct repeats is a bit complex in the binding, while the PTE promoter is much more easily recognized as an inverted repeat. And that might be the reason for the different affinities of the protein for the different promoters, because here we have a very complex way of binding, while here is much more easier than an inverted repeat as most transcriptional factors do. We didn't identify how the copy sense by the system. For those that are familiar with metalloregulatory proteins, most metalloregulatory proteins are the sensor part is directly in the transcriptional factor. It binds to the metal and it will change its binding to DNA. So the first thing we tried was to see whether the binding to the DNA was affected by the presence of copper. And copper can be found in two forms, in a reduced or oxidized form. And none of the forms were able to change the binding to the DNA of the protein. So probably copy is not sensed through the transcriptional factor, but it's sensed through the other part of the system, the, the protease. Because remember that the transcriptional factor levels are controlled by the protease in response to copper. So the sensing system was probably the protease. Unfortunately, the protease are uh, integral membrane protein, so we could not do biochemistry easily with it. We tried to purify it, we couldn't, because it was insoluble, we couldn't solubilize it to use it. So we set up a in vitro assay using wool cell extracts of synecosystis. Wool cell extracts contain both the cytosol and a membranes. We added recombinant PET-R, the transcriptional factor, and follow degradation with time. We did this extract and we didn't add any copper. We didn't see the degradation of the protein while the degradation was activated by copper. And you see that the degradation. Actually, this degradation depended on the presence of PET-P, the protease, because in a mutant lacking the protease, you wouldn't see any degradation, while we still see it in a PET-R mutant strain lacking the transcriptional factor. This data suggested that the protease was sensing copper and that was degrading the transcriptional factor, but because this was done with wholesale extracts, we couldn't rule out that there was an additional factor involved in this degradation. To roll out this possibility, we did exactly the same assay, but using E. coli extract transformed with a plasmid that covered these two genes, PET R and PET P, or a control with an empty plasmid. And we observed exactly the same result, that the transcriptional factor was degraded in the presence of copper only when we added the PET P gene to the system. We know that PET P is responding to copper, degrading the transcriptional factor. We didn't know which are sensing in the protein. And for that, we analyzed all PET P sequences from cyanobacteria. At the moment, I think it was 160 different PP, and we found a few amino acids that were completely conserved in all sequences, and two of them standed out as a possible copper binding sites, two methionines that were completely conserved, and they were actually located in a periplasmic domain of the protein. To test if these two methionines were involved in copper sensing, we generated the cytidine mutants and introduced them in synecosystem. And I said the activity of the PTP promoter using a reported gene YP under the control of the PTP promoter. As you see in the wild type, you see exactly the same thing we've seen before with the proteins or the RNA. That the PTP promoter is not expressed in the presence of BCSA. It's a bit more expressed in the menos copper media and it's much higher expressed when we add copper to the media. We did the same analysis for the side of the mutants at a single or double mutants, and we saw that they were really affected in copper sense. When we analyzed the proteins itself, we saw that the single mutants showed an intermediate phenotype between a mutant lacking complete activity. It's not here, but the PTP mutant is exactly the same as the double mutant. We don't see accumulation at all of the PTE gene, and we see a higher accumulation of PET-R, while the single mutants were still a bit responsive to copper. So pointing out that they really these two methionines are involved in copper sensing and only lacking one of them is not enough to completely abolish the sensing by the system. Something we also realized during this work is that the levels of the proteins not always correlates with mRNA levels. Because when we analyze the plasmid levels, in the wild type, we see there's no protein without copper, a bit more protein with low copper and much more higher levels in the presence of copper. And the beta mutants, we always see some plasmid even in the absence of, of copper, are much higher when copper was added. Of course, in the PET-P mutants, we cannot detect the protein. And a similar thing happens for the cytochrome C6. 
So in cytochrome C6, we see a clear down regulation in the wild type that was already described before. So it's nothing surprising, but we see a, almost the same regulation in the PP mutant where the mRNA levels of the corresponding gene is constant. It doesn't change at all. So that suggests that there's an additional structural level of regulation in this gene. For placenta, it's quite easy to think about the stability of the protein without copper. So with low copper, you get as much protein as copper is present in the media. In the case of the cytochrome C6, it's always iron, always in synthesis in the cell. So that this regulation can be explained by different stability of the protein in the presence of copper. Well, we identified the components, we identified more or less the sensing model, but that this really affects growth because it's very nice to have genes regulated, but what's the real phenotype of this regulation? It was well known before that cytochrome C6 or plasmacenin are affecting growth in the condition where these proteins are supposed to be expressed and the other is not expressed. So for plasmacenin in the presence of copper, we see slower growth and the same thing for BJ mutants in the absence of copper. So that's what happens to our regulatory mutants. For that, PETR mutants are very similar to PJ mutants. So they are behaves like mutants lacking the cytochrome C6, exactly what we saw in the gene expression studies. So that's good. For PP mutants, we don't see a phenotype like the one that we see in the PT. E. It's just because PP loses the regulation but express always the cytochrome C6. So there's always an electron transporter, even in the presence of copper. So they're not affected in growth. Then we analyzed the photosynthetic performance using the oxygen evolution, and we saw that the PJ mutants are affected without copper. The R mutants are a bit less affected, but we still see a clear difference. In the presence of copper, but you see clearly that the PT mutant of the plasma are really affected. But to our surprise, the PP mutant that didn't show a phenotype in growth was really affected in oxygen evolution, showing that something else might be changing in this mutant. Up to now, we don't have an idea of what's going on here, and that's something we wanted to pursue in the future. Well, this regulatory system and the plus training itself it was probably acquired soon after oxygenic photosynthesis evolved because of the reduced availability of iron. So we thought it might be worth to try to see if there is a phenotype related to iron deprivation or iron limitation because we don't do a real deprivation. We actually see a difference, although there's not very nice statistical difference between the strains, but we see better performance of mutants that are constituted express plasmacenin. So really having a plasmacenin in iron deficient media, it makes you to grow a bit better. And it's true not only for iron deficient, but also for iron and copper deficient media. Although I have to say that it's not zero copper here. It's always a remaining of copper. So expressing the plasmacenin considerably is good when you don't have iron. And actually not expressing always cytochrome C6 is not that great because you grow a bit less. We still need to repeat this spread a bit more, even though it's like six or seven repeats already here. But uh, iron depletion is not always very reproducible. And just to finish uh, this, are there other electron transporters between cytochrome B6F and PS1? This has been a bit of controversy like a few years ago because they were described that the mutants lacking one or the other electron transporter were still able to grow in the condition where the proteins were not supposed to be expressed. And that's true. So the mutant grows very slowly in the presence of copper, but it that grows. It doesn't die. It still keeps growing. It's like 10% of the wild type. So if you do a short-term experiment, you don't see growth, but if you incubate them for longer, they will eventually grow. And the same happens for the PJ mutants in the absence of copper. And this led some people to propose that there are other electron transporters. First thing we did, and something that people have done before in the past, is try to generate a double mutant, like in both of them. And as you can see here, it's not possible. It's only in one direction. So in a PE background, deleting PJ is not possible, but you try in the other direction exactly the same. It's just not possible. And that really shows you that you need one or the other for growth. And we tried it in many different conditions, low light, with copper, without copper, with iron, without iron, in all possible combinations you can think about. And we tried for more than four years and didn't manage to get it. Actually, we got one, but what happens is that the, the PJ gene just jumped into another place in the genome. <laughs> so we got one segregated, but when we analyzed it in more detail, it was just not a mutant. It didn't lack the PJ. But to our surprise, it is not only not possible to segregate double mutant lacking like both of them, but it was also impossible to segregate double mutant lacking like the plasmacenin and the PET-R gene, or the cytochrome C6 and the PET-P gene. 
These two strains were not viable. They were not able to segregate. While it's possible to have a pit E, pit P double mutant, that's fine, that, that segregates. And a pit J, pit R mutant, that is fine, it will segregate. Actually, these two double mutants suppresses the phenotypes of the corresponding single mutants in the electron transporter. So the double mutant, like in the plasmonin and the protease, will grow even in the presence of copper, almost to the wild type rates. The explanation for this in a wild type, even in the presence of copper, you always see a bit of cytochrome C6. I'm sure that people have used PJ promoter to try to switch off essential genes, have noticed already this, that you never go to zero expression. But this is not the case for the PAT-R mutants. The PAT-R mutants lack the activator and the levels of cytochrome C6 are much lower than in the wild type, even in the presence of copper. The opposite happens for pet P in the absence of copper. There's always plus learning, even in the presence of BCSA in the wild type, or even in a pet J mutant, but not in pet P. Although you can see here a band, it's actually a cross-reactive band. It's not a plus learning, okay? The plus learning is a bit higher than here. You see the cross-reactive band also in the wild type, although it's not very clear in the photograph. So it's two bands in the wild type, only one band in the pet P strain. This is actually ugly because we have to really load a lot of proteins, uh, more than 200 micrograms of total extracts here, because otherwise you don't see the signal. And that's probably why people before have proposed that it was possible to grow without any of the transporters, because only if you really overload and overexpose this Western block, you see the signal for the proteins. And just to sum up, so we have identified a regulatory system for the PJ, PTE switch in general bacteria. It's composed by a membrane protease that will sense copper through two methionines and will regulate the levels of the transcriptional factor that binds to both genes, activating one and representing the other. Um, but there's still many things missing. We don't know how the same TF will activate one and repress the other because this family of transcriptional factors have been only described as a repressor. So it's none of this family known to be an activator. So we still have a lot of work to do on how this protein will activate transcription. We still don't know how copper gets inside the cells. The transporters for copper are completely unknown in all cell bacteria. And one thing I didn't mention is that we don't know which membrane the protein is targeted to, because most copper in cyanobacteria is inside the thylakoid and bound to plasmodium. When it's copper, most of the copper is inside the thylakoid. And we shown before that the other copper in synecocytes, the COP-S that is involved in copper resistance, is actually present in both membranes, both the cell membrane and the thylakoid membrane, because most of the copper is bound here. So you have to really measure what is going on in the thylakoid to regulate properly the copper homeostasis in cyanobacteria. Thanks for listening. I will take any questions uh, you may have.